Hello, everyone. I'm Olympia. Thank you for being here with me in this wonderful place called Lights Out Library. And I have a great story to tell you. Tonight, we're going to explore the history of colors. What does this mean exactly? Colors haven't changed throughout history, after all. And our ancestors saw the same colors that we see today. Our ancestors, of course, saw colors in nature mostly. Whereas our world is full of artificially colored items. Whether in clothing, toys, food packaging, or household items that we use daily, we are surrounded by an abundance of colorful items. If anything, we are now less likely to experience colors as they occur in nature. From various surveys conducted around the world, we know that blue is the favorite color of the majority, followed by green, red, and purple. It's hard to know how our ancestors would have responded to the same questions a century ago or even a thousand years ago, and there's really no way of knowing. The appeal of colors may be cultural to some extent, or it may be something inherent to us as animals, signifying danger or food or reproductive opportunities. But those favorite colors, blue, followed by green, red, and purple, enjoy almost the same ranking from one country to the next. So maybe there is a biological aspect to it, or it has something to do with the feelings and experiences associated with each as we navigate through life. There aren't many negative things that we can associate with the colors blue or green, for example, that may explain the preference. There are various theories, but no concrete scientific explanation for why we prefer some colors over others. And we really don't know how this preference has evolved. We don't even know if we've always perceived and classified colors in the same way we do now. For example, all the various shades that we now collectively call blue were not a single color to the Greeks. To them, dark and light blue were entirely different hues. But what we can explore in this story is how the significance of colors, their symbolism, and the status we attach to them has evolved over the centuries. Colors were very important in many ancient cultures and had strictly enforced codes attached to them. Some colors were even prohibited or limited to use by a certain group of people. Tonight's story will demonstrate that this is not a random phenomenon or one that we can consider separately from the availability of resources or historical constraints, including the rarity of pigments in specific regions of the world, religion, political events, geography, and the development of art. All of these contribute to shaping our tastes in colors and the significance that we attach to them. As always, you do not need to watch the video to follow along. If you wish to, you may close your eyes and forget about any worries as we embark on this adventure together. Also, we just launch a Patreon page for those of you who wish to support this project and get more of it. If you join, you will get various new things, like the possibility to listen to all episodes with background sounds, regular bonus episodes, 
The first one about the history of glassmaking and stained glass is already available there. You will be able to download all these audios, and you will also have your say on the choices of topics, advanced releases, and updates on upcoming episodes. We hope to see you there soon, so that we may continue developing Lights Out Library, which we enjoy so much. You will find links in the description box and the first comment pinned under the video. If you fall asleep and wish to resume the video later or jump directly to a particular part of the story, timestamps are also listed in the description and pinned in the first comment, as well as links to different streaming options like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music, which may be better suited for you. But before we begin, take a long, deep, relaxing breath. When you exhale, release the tension in your shoulders and your neck. Release the tension in your facial muscles, too. And allow the sound of my voice to guide you through this journey. And now, let's explore the world of colors together. We're going to begin our journey with the color blue. Blue is apparently the king of colors nowadays, as the surveys I mentioned seem to indicate. In many countries, blue has been the favorite since the beginning of the 20th century for almost the entire population. We don't know whether this was already the case several centuries ago, but we do know that if we go back to ancient times, blue was much less commonly used than it is now. Of course, the color blue is unavoidable. It is the color of the sky, generally, and of the seas and lakes, but also it's much less common in plants, animals, and all the raw materials that our ancestors relied on to make objects. Metals, wood, stones, clay. The color blue is absent from cave art, and it remained uncommon in man-made objects until late in antiquity. Except for ancient Egypt, it seems the color blue was not particularly prestigious or sought after during antiquity, at least compared with colors like red, purple, white, or black. As an example of an ancient civilization that did not care much for blue is ancient Greece. It is little known that the Greeks classified colors by how light or dark they were, rather than by their hue. The Greek word for dark blue, for example, kianos, could mean dark blue, dark green, brown, or black. And the word for light blue, glaucos, could also indicate gray, light green, or even yellow. In their perception, there was no way dark and light blue could be the same color. Contrary to colors like red, ochre, or purple, it was hard to find good pigments in nature for blue. The minerals were limited to lapis lazuli, which was rare and precious, or azurite which is a copper mineral and also not easy to find. When it came to dyes for textiles, these were discovered late in antiquity. There were two plants mainly. In Europe, woad, a plant native to the steppe of Central Asia, and the Caucasus, which then expanded to the south and west of Europe where it was cultivated as a source of 
blue dye. The leaves of woad provided a dye that was the primary source of blue used in Europe, from the Neolithic to the end of the Middle Ages. It was cultivated especially in Germany, England, and France. Sometimes entire cities became prosperous over the centuries, thanks to the cultivation of woad. For example, the city of Toulouse, in the south of France. There are still mansions in Toulouse today that were built several centuries ago by those made prosperous by dye manufacturing. Even long before that, woad was used by the Celts, especially in Britain, where the Romans noted that some tribes covered their bodies and faces in blue. Actually, the Picts, an ancient people from the north of Great Britain, are called the Picts, from Latin Picti, meaning the painted ones. Woad provided a relatively light blue, not the intense blue that another plant, indigo, was able to produce. I'll talk about indigo in a minute because for centuries, it became one of the most important dyes in the world. The Romans knew of and used blue dye, but in clothing mainly, and the color was associated primarily with the working class. Color codes were strictly enforced in Rome. White and red were used by the upper classes but the most prestigious of all colors was purple, which came from a rare and precious kind of dye. Purple was a symbol of power. Blue clothing, on the other hand, was considered relatively basic. So Europe and most of the Mediterranean world used woad as a dye for textiles. But at the same time in Asia, the source of blue dye was indigo, which was also independently discovered in South America. Fabrics dyed with indigo that are 6,000 years old were discovered in Peru. Indigo is not a plant. Rather, it is the name given to the indigo dye itself. And different plants help to produce it, including woad. However, woe doesn't have the concentrations necessary to produce deep blue, unlike other plants from the genus Indigofera, which naturally grow in tropical and subtropical regions of the world. These plants were abundant in India, where indigo was cultivated, and blue dye and dyed textiles were exported starting several thousand years ago already. India was the major center of indigo production in the world. From India, indigo made its way to Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, and the Mediterranean Sea. The Greeks and the Romans knew of it and considered indigo a luxury item. It is not coincidental that the word indigo sounds like India. The Greeks called it indicon, meaning Indian, and the Romans Latinized the word to indicum, which then passed to Italian and eventually to other European languages, giving us indigo in Spanish, French, or English. Indigo dyes were also used in Africa for centuries, where there was a long tradition of using clothes dyed with indigo as a symbol of wealth. This was true for many tribes, including Yoruba in Nigeria, the Mandika of Mali, and the Tuareg nomads 
in the Sahara. Indigo was better than woad for several reasons. It produced a more intense blue and was also more cost-effective. Indigo arriving from India was very expensive through the end of the Middle Ages and was a luxury product, as I mentioned. But once navigators in the 16th century found a direct sea route between India and Europe and the dye's main middlemen disappeared, the price finally dropped in European markets. Indigo-producing plants were among the colonial crops that Europeans introduced and developed in the Americas. Indigo thrived in the Caribbean, among other products like tobacco, sugar, coffee, cocoa, and cotton, and threatened to destroy the centuries-old woad industry in Europe. Some countries, like Germany and France, initially banned its import to protect their woad industry, but it couldn't last, and woad-based dyes declined to the point of becoming marginalized. Indigo dye was produced in blocks that were an intense deep blue color, and it could be diluted to dye textiles or to make paint. The dominant use of indigo lasted well into the 19th century when it was replaced by synthetic dyes. We'll come back to that later. Apart from plants, another source of blue pigment in the ancient world was from minerals like lapis lazuli. And it was, in part, blue made from this source that made Egypt the only ancient civilization to assign high status to the color. In Egypt, blue was associated with divinity and good luck. Lapis lazuli, being rare and very expensive, came from Afghanistan and also used to make precious jewelry. But it wasn't the only kind of blue available to Egyptians. Beginning in the third century, the ancient Egyptians also started to produce a blue pigment called Egyptian blue, which they invented. It was a mix of various minerals like silica, lime, and copper that were heated, and the resulting material is believed to be the first synthetic pigment ever created. It could be ground up and used for a variety of applications. For example, to paint wood and papyrus, an early form of paper. For frescoes, to color glass, and to create blue fiance, blue inlays and side vases. The Romans learned this artificial pigment recipe and also used it. But after the decline of the Roman Empire, the recipe was lost and was only recently rediscovered. I mentioned before that the Greeks and the Romans considered blue to be a relatively minor color, but one culture where it became much more significant in the centuries following the fall of the Western Roman Empire was in Islamic countries. Islamic architects and decorators used a lot of blue tiles to cover countless palaces and mosques from the south of Spain to Central Asia. Most of these still exist today, and their facades with geometric patterns or floral details have stood the test of time. One appeal of the color blue in monumental architecture is that it is not common in nature beyond the sky and the sea. So using a color that evokes the heavens to decorate a building indicates something sacred or at least remarkable. But still, blue was not the favorite color in the Islamic world. Green and white were. 
Green was, in fact, said to be the prophet's favorite color. And it's understandable for cultures that developed in regions with a lot of deserts and a scarcity of water that green became the favorite color, which in nature indicates plants, life, a water source, something welcoming. Sometimes, depending on the place and time, blue was a color only worn by Christian and Jewish minorities living in Muslim countries, whereas green and white were limited to Muslims. In Christian countries, it is also through architecture that the status of the color blue began to change, as happened with the development of Gothic architecture and stained glass. Until the 12th century, blue played a minor role, its status unchanged since the times of Rome, and only poor people would wear blue. Maybe they preferred the color blue, but in society, the color of prestige, of power, nobility, and faith was red which we'll discuss more later. This was the case until the 12th century, when the status of the color blue began to change, and it all started around 1130 with the Gothic Revolution in religious architecture. It was with this revolution that large, stained-glass windows in churches and cathedrals began to appear. The people who saw these first large stained glass windows thought they were absolutely wonderful. This colored light filtering into their place of worship was awe-inspiring, like nothing they had ever dreamed of before. Stained glass windows were often colored with cobalt, which produced blue glass. Together with a bit of red, it filled a church with a bluish-violet light that seemed completely otherworldly. This started in Paris, initially in St. Denis Basilica, then in St. Chapelle, in the center of Paris. From Paris, it spread to many Gothic works, including, for example, the Cathedral of Chartres, in a town south of Paris that to this day still has blue stained glass windows from the early Gothic. It took decades, but this new Gothic style in Western Europe really changed perceptions of the color blue. Thanks to its recent association with the sacred, with peace and serenity, it became much more desirable and prestigious for the first time in centuries. Around the same time, another factor of religious and artistic nature that changed the status of the color blue was the veneration of the Virgin Mary and the colors used to paint her clothes. In the 12th century, the Roman Catholic Church instructed painters to represent Mary with the most expensive pigment that arrived in Europe, ultramarine. Ultramarine was basically ground and refined lapis lazuli and produced what we would call the color cobalt blue. Using lapis lazuli as a pigment was not new. As I mentioned earlier, the Egyptians and Mesopotamians did it thousands of years earlier. But in medieval Europe, it was now more expensive than ever. Traveling along the Silk Road from Afghanistan, arriving in Italy via Venice and Genoa at a higher cost than gold. A new, longer process of refinement that removed impurities meant that ultramarine made from lapis lazuli powder, produced a very rich and deep blue, unlike any other pigment. 
It didn't take long before the kings and princes of Europe also embraced blue because of its high cost and exclusivity and prestige. The first to adopt blue were the kings of France, especially Louis IX, also known as Saint Louis. A blue shield with a golden fleur-de-lis, which is a type of iris, became the coat of arms of the kings of France, and it took just a few decades for blue to spread to royal clothing and insignias throughout Europe. Blue became a symbol of wealth and power. Blue also became the king of colors in paintings, and its shades began to change and refine with technical evolutions. In the Middle Ages, paint was often made with tempera, a quick-drying paint made of pigments and a binder, usually egg yolk, which could be dissolved in water. During the Renaissance, oil paint started to replace tempera on a large scale, at least for the most prestigious paintings. Besides their different composition, oil paints also changed the way colors looked on canvas and how they could be used, now tending to be shinier and darker. The ultramarine pigment, for example, in oil paint, tended to be very dark. For this reason, artists like Raphael started to add white to it. In the late Middle Ages, the clothes of the Virgin Mary were depicted as a vivid blue or dark blue, and with the addition of white, it became sky blue instead. This sky blue color was adopted by artists as a traditional color used to represent Mary, and even religious paintings from the 19th century continued to use it, even though they no longer used ultramarine pigment. Another highly sought-after luxury item from the Middle Ages that featured blue was ceramics, especially Chinese porcelain. For centuries, Chinese had the monopoly on porcelain. Having discovered the recipe that made it perfectly white and slightly transparent, by comparison, ceramics from other parts of the world look thicker and less refined. Chinese craftsmen developed various colors to decorate ornate porcelain objects. This couldn't be done with regular paint because the items had to be heated to high temperatures. In the ninth century, Chinese artisans started using cobalt salts to manufacture blue and white porcelain. And later, in the Middle Ages, these pieces began to be exported to Europe via the Silk Road. For centuries, Europeans tried to imitate this white and blue porcelain there were attempts in England, in France, in the Low Countries, and Russia. Maybe one of the most successful was Delft, porcelain from the city of Delft in the Netherlands. But it wasn't until the 18th century that the secret recipe was finally discovered, and the quality of European porcelain could more closely match that of Chinese porcelain. By the 15th century, indigo had become affordable for the working class and could be used in clothing by everyone, from peasants to kings. Indigo replaced woad as a primary textile dye, making blue relatively cheap, with the added benefit of being very lasting. Now that the color was associated with authority and was also relatively affordable, it spread to many new uses, for example, military uniforms. Blue became the color of foot soldiers and sailors in many countries. Maybe partly because of its popularity, it was subverted by revolutionary armies. 
at the end of the 18th century, after the outbreak of the American Revolution, blue became, in 1779, the official color of the United States military uniforms, and its use continued in the U.S. Army until 1902. The dress uniform is still blue today. French revolutionaries also adopted blue, as opposed to the white of French royalists and the Austrians, who were their main opponents at the beginning of the French Revolution. Napoleon kept blue as the color of his army's uniform, and it was abandoned in France only in 1915 because it was too visible on the battlefields. But after these revolutions, blue increasingly became the color of governments and authorities in the 19th century, and still is to a large extent. Blue is the go-to color for policemen and other public servants as well as for school uniforms. And the reason continues to be the symbolism attached to this color, plus its low cost. The rise of indigo had turned blue into the most produced dye in the world. The success of indigo is the reason why blue jeans are blue. They are made of denim, which is a cotton textile. Denim was invented in Europe, and the name denim actually comes from Serge de Nîmes. Nîmes is a city in the southeast of France, where the first versions of the fabric were made. Blue jeans became immensely popular in America starting around 1875 and they even turned into a symbol of the U.S. denim and was produced in various places. But it was adapted to make pants in the U.S. starting in the 1700s, and it makes sense because cotton and indigo were large crops in the U.S. at the time. Actually, the word jeans also comes from French. The port of Genoa, Italy, is called Jeanne in France, which became jeans in its anglicized form. The absolute peak of the indigo industry was in the 19th century, because after eliminating other blue dyes, indigo in itself became the victim of a new, more affordable product, synthetic indigo. The substitute was discovered in Germany in 1878 and gradually replaced natural indigo, which collapsed completely in two to three decades. The trade of natural indigo from India and the West Indies disappeared completely in the 1920s. Nowadays, almost all blue clothing is dyed with a synthetic dye called in Danthreme Blue. All the natural indigo dyes are used only for a very small scale production, like artisan crafts, or for the restoration of vintage textiles. Ultramarine in paintings, that is to say, ground and refined lapis lazuli, also disappeared and was replaced with new pigments especially Prussian blue, which also produces a vivid deep blue, but for a fraction of the cost. The Prussian blue is the blue you see in Impressionist paintings or in Japanese prints. It was one of the first Western products to be imported to Japan. Nowadays, we are probably surrounded by more blue man-made objects than at any time in human history. Blue has completely lost its ancient association with the lower social classes, and most people now tend to associate the color with feelings like serenity or liberty, and, though it seems contradictory, with authority. 
blue appears to suggest to a majority of people a type of authority that is legitimate and not too overbearing and remains heavily used by governments. The old reason for using the color, the cheap cost, and ready availability of indigo no longer exist. In fact, at this point, the use of blue in law enforcement or for formal military uniforms is a mix of tradition with maybe a little calculation. Governments use the positive feelings attached to this color in the population. Now, let's change color and talk about red, which is in tight competition with green for second favorite color around the world. The rise of blue took thousands of years due to the limited number of naturally occurring pigments. Red, however, has never had this problem and was one of the first colors used by humans. The earliest source of red was probably ochre, which is a type of clay that can range in color from yellow to brown, depending on its exact composition. When there is enough iron oxide or rust present in the clay, ochre is red. The range of possible colors produced by ochre are the ones we typically associate with cave art, along with black, which was made with charcoal most of the time. This is evidence that late Stone Age people, over 40,000 years ago, were already scraping and grinding ochre to make a red powder that they might have used to paint and decorate their bodies. Apart from ochre, another natural source of red is hematite and iron oxide, which is widespread in rocks and soils. And there were other sources of red pigment besides minerals. Starting in the late Neolithic period, a red dye was created by drying and crushing small insects like Kermis vermilio and Cochineal. These insects live on the roots and stems of different plants, and they contain pigments that offer very vivid red in various shades, like vermilion or carmine. This type of pigment has been discovered in sites from the Neolithic period, and in fact, insect based red dye is still in use today, particularly in foods. And finally, there were plant-based dyes, especially one made from the roots of a plant called rubia, also known as matter, that were used to dye fabrics around the Mediterranean, India, and China. Like blue, red was quickly invested with a lot of symbolism. Red was an important color in all ancient civilizations, but had different, sometimes ambivalent, meanings, maybe in part because red is the color of blood. In ancient Egypt, it was associated with health, life, and victory. Egyptian women used red to color their nails and hair, and ochre powder to redden their cheeks and lips but it was also the color of heat and destruction, and there are ancient Egyptian prayers asking for protection against everything evil and red. Red was also used as a dye for clothing in Egypt, India, and China, and in all of these cultures it was one of the most frequently used colors in man-made objects. In clothes, painted walls, poetry, and lacquerware. In China, the color red had an increasingly positive association over time and was and is still considered to be the color of luck and prosperity. The gates and walls of places were painted red, and to this day, red dominates Chinese celebrations. 
Red also played an important role in Chinese philosophy, according to which there are five elements, and each color has a color. Metal, wood, water, fire, and earth. Red was the color of fire. During several dynasties, when a new emperor rose to the throne, his fortune tellers would tell him what color would bring the most success to his reign. And until the Ming dynasty, that is, the early modern period, red was considered to be a noble color. On the other side of the planet, in Mesoamerica, red was probably the most used color in architecture. The Maya painted their pyramids and palaces red. We don't always know to what extent or its exact meaning to them, but human blood and human sacrifice were a major aspect of all Mesoamerican civilizations and their religion and belief systems in general. So obviously the color red was assigned particular significance. It was sacred, and the one color that could please the gods and ensure the continuation of the world. To the Romans, red had the status that blue enjoys in our modern period. It was, in any case, the most important color, the one that represented power, authority, the army, and victory. Roman soldiers wore red tunics, and officers wore cloaks that could range from crimson to purple. When a Roman general triumphed in battle, he would have his entire body painted red. The Romans also developed a new pigment for painting called vermilion, which was a vivid red that came from the mineral cinnabar. They had cinnabar mines in Spain, from which it was exported to Italy and the rest of the Roman Empire. This pigment was highly resilient. Now, twenty years later, the frescoes painted in Roman villas, like in Pompeii, are still bright and colorful. And once again, economic considerations played a role. The most expensive and rarest kind of dye in Roman antiquity was purple, obtained from a shell that gave a reddish-purple hue. Its rarity meant that it became the color of emperors, and its use by common people was forbidden in order to protect the color code that delineated the social classes. The symbolism attached to red did not disappear from the Western Roman Empire, as its successors also adopted it as a color of significance. The Eastern Roman Empire of Byzantium maintained the same hierarchy of colors with red, the color of emperors and power on top. The new princess in Europe and the Catholic Church did the same. At least they did until blue became the new red in the 12th, 13th centuries, as I described before. Before that, red was a favorite color of European kings and was frequently used in clothing during the Middle Ages. It was a very popular color, but not everyone wore the same shade of red. Red dye for ordinary people was made with rubia the plant I mentioned before that was used as a red dye for thousands of years. The color it produced was more brick red and faded easily in the sun or from washing. Bright red was reserved for the wealthy, and only royalty and aristocrats could wear scarlet clothing dyed with expensive insect-based dyes. Just like blue dyes, an entire industry developed around this high-end red. The insects were abundant in Europe and around the Mediterranean Sea. But the process required to create a bright scarlet was long and complicated. 
The insects had to be gathered, dried, crushed, and then boiled along with other ingredients. Makers of scarlet dye protected their secrets fiercely. But just like the producers of wood-based blue dyes who were put out of business when indigo reached Europe, the producers of scarlet dye based on kermis insects were replaced by a new dye made from another insect found during exploration of the world. This time not from India, but from the Americas. When the army of Hernán Cortés conquered the Aztecs in Mexico, they discovered not only silver and gold, but also the cochineal insect, which produced a red dye, like Kermes is, in fact, related to it, but which could be harvested more frequently. It resulted in a stronger and brighter red than the best kermis and additionally worked very well on luxury textiles like silk. The first shipments of cochineal were sent to Europe in the 1520s and it progressively replaced other pigments for luxury dyeing. It also served as a pigment for fine paintings. The reds in the works of painters like Rembrandt, Vermeer, Velázquez, or Tintoretto came from Cachineal. Like in ancient times, red in the arts, especially vivid red, retained its association with passion, war, and violence. Sometimes it was seen, and is still seen, as an intense color. But due to the rise of blue starting in the 12th century, red progressively lost its association with royalty and power. With the exception of a few countries like England. However, in the 18th century, red started to gain a new political and symbolic meaning, starting during the French Revolution. There were various parties fighting for influence between the storming of the Bastille in 1789 and the rise of Napoleon ten years later. The mainstream revolutionaries in the early stages of the revolution intended to create a constitutional monarchy and adopted blue, as I mentioned earlier, in part because it had been the color of the American revolutionaries, in contrast to the white flag of the royalists. But the more radical parties and politicians at the time, who we would now consider the far left, adopted a red flag. Red, of course, represented intensity and the idea of war, but it was also the color used by the government to declare a state of emergency or a siege. It meant alert. So these radicals meant for the use of the color to be a call to action. Supporters of their cause wore the red Phrygian cap, modeled after the cap that freed slaves, wore in ancient Rome. For a short period of time, especially with the figure of Robespierre, the revolution took on a more populist, or what we would call today, more leftist character. However, this movement didn't last long and was eventually sidelined or eliminated. However, symbolically, this movement turned red into a political color, adopted by new political movements in the 19th century with the emergence of socialism. In 1848, there was another revolution in France that replaced the monarchy with the new republic, and protesters, mainly Parisian workers, once again used the red flag as a direct reference to the revolution of the late 18th century. There were various uprisings against monarchies across Europe in 1848, and they also used the red flag. Two years later, the red flag reappeared during the Paris Commune, 
In 1870, the city of Paris revolted for two months as the regime of Napoleon III, the Second Empire, was collapsing. Ultimately, the revolt was eventually crushed, but it remained a source of inspiration for left-wing revolutionaries across Europe as a model of what a popular insurrection could look like. At the time, Paris and its surroundings were very industrialized, and an industrial working class had appeared. So, this seemed to fit quite well into Marx's predictions and model of working class insurrection. But the sociology remained very different in the rest of France. There were small movements in big cities, but the rest of the country just didn't follow the insurrection. So the French army besieged and then crushed the Paris Commune. From then on, the red flag became the symbol of the social movement and was claimed by Marxist parties. It became the color of communist countries in the 20th century, from China to Eastern Europe. The notable exception to this trend was the United States. Around the world, red is traditionally associated with the left and blue with the right. In the U.S., however, blue is the color of the Democrats and red the Republicans. This color switch is actually very recent, though. Until the 1980s, Democrats were often represented by red, while Republicans were associated with blue. However, in the 1980s and 90s, different newspapers and television networks began to use the colors differently, according to their own logic. It was only after the 2000 election that major media outlets began conforming to the same inverted color scheme. Now, this color scheme has become so widely recognized in political language that it is unlikely to change any time soon. In this respect, the United States' use of these colors is an exception to their common global usage. Returning to dyes, cock and neal and plants like matter or cheaper dyes had become industries of their own until the 19th century. Just like indigo, they fell victim to technical progress. An organic compound called alizarin was discovered and synthesized from coal tar, a very cheap raw material. This new synthetic red dye was not only cheaper, but also more long-lasting. In a matter of years, the import of cochineal from Latin America and the cultivation of matter in Europe completely disappeared. Red remains an ambivalent color. Nowadays, it's still politically charged, but beyond that, it is associated with intensity. It can represent courage and sacrifice, as seen in the red poppy flower worn on Remembrance Day in Commonwealth countries. It is also the color of love, of happiness and celebration most frequently associated with Christmas, Valentine's Day, red carpet events, and seats at opera houses. But at the same time, red can represent anger, aggression, or danger. It is the traditional color of warning signs, and this association with violence or danger is very ancient. I mentioned earlier that red flags could signal a state of emergency in the 18th century France. But even earlier, in the Middle Ages or on pirate ships, red flags indicated mortal warfare, wherein the losers would not be taken prisoner but would instead be executed. In Western countries, with a Christian tradition, there can be a religious dimension to the color. The church adopted red as a symbol of authority, a practice it inherited from Rome. Cardinals are dressed in red during official ceremonies. Continuing the tradition of Roman purple, 
But Christian theology also associates the color with sin, with sexual passion, and with the devil. In religious iconography and in popular culture, Satan or demons are often depicted as black or red. So, maybe more than any other color, red is a source of conflicting interpretations, ranging from red light districts to red carpets, from red flags to red-blooded good hell, and from red heart emojis to seeing red when angry. What these emotions and interpretations all have in common is their intensity. I think we can at least agree that, for some people, red is not perceived as a relaxing color. Before we conclude our exploration, let's talk about one last favorite color, green. Despite its predominance in nature, Green was not an easy color to reproduce in prehistoric times. It could have been obtained by mixing blue and yellow pigments, but as we have already discussed, blue pigments were also hard to find. Therefore, we have no known trace of green man-made pigments before antiquity. But green is very present in nature due to chlorophyll and is therefore the color we effortlessly associate with plants and vegetation in general. Its positive perception probably stems from this association. The appeal of green was likely even stronger in the first agrarian societies. It literally meant life, growth, or rebirth. And this is the traditional association we find in ancient societies. The Egyptians found green pigments in malachite, a semi-precious stone that was ground up for paint. When it came to textiles, they would dye fabrics twice first with saffron, which gave a yellow color, and then with the woad plant, which produced a blue dye. The hieroglyph for green represented a growing papyrus, showing the rich association of color with generation and life to the Egyptians. As with blue, the Greeks showed little interest in green. It was almost absent from their art, and they didn't have the same categories of colors that we have. If you remember, blue and green were not always distinguished from one another and could be given the same name based on how light or dark they were. Democritus, a Greek philosopher, described pale and dark green as two completely different colors, which we would just call green nowadays, but which were entirely different to him. The Romans showed more appreciation for green in paintings, Mosaics are glassware, but like blue, it was a relatively secondary color in their production of arts and crafts. In the color code of the European Middle Ages, green occupied an intermediate position. As we have seen, red dominated for the nobility, while the peasants would wear blue, brown, or gray. Green was mostly the color of a small, urban upper-middle class, the gentry, that is, lesser aristocrats, merchants, and bankers, wore green as a sign of distinction. Green dyes were relatively weak and gave a brownish kind of green. So for fine clothes, the textile would be dyed twice, first in yellow and then in blue. For painters, there were more options for pigments. There was malachite and also an artificial pigment called verdigris, made by soaking copper in fermenting wine. The one culture in the world where green dominated was Islam. In Islamic countries, green is the traditional color of Islam, and it appears even nowadays on most flags of predominantly Muslim countries. According to tradition, the robe and the banner of the Prophet 
Muhammad were green. In Islam, having been born in desert regions of the world, where vegetation and vivid green indicated the presence of water and food, the color retained a very positive significance. Also by traditions, in Muslim countries, this Islamic green is said to be the color of paradise. Apart from Islam, green can have a religious significance in some Christian countries, too. It may be used by Roman Catholic and part of the Protestant clergy during some periods of the year when there is no particular celebration approaching. These periods are called ordinary time, but it is also the color of Christmas together with red, and this is likely inherited from pre-Christian times, when evergreens were worshipped because they had the ability to maintain their green color all year round, including through the winter season. The first affordable pigments for painting and the first green dyes that could give a good, vivid green color appeared quite recently in the 18th and 19th centuries accompanying the rise of modern chemistry. Green nowadays is a fairly popular color and is widely embraced. There are colors like brown, yellow, orange, or even red that are polarizing, but green isn't. The association with nature, especially in urbanized society, where the daily contact with nature is limited, makes it appealing. In this sense, maybe green will be the new blue. As you know, it also started to become politicized as a color. Environmentalists and parties in favor of ecology have adopted it. They are generally considered to be on the left, and the color green for them is, at the same time, a way to represent their commitment to the environment and to distance themselves from the moral traditional left represented by the color red. There is so much more I could say about colors, but we have reached the end of this colorful journey. Having only really discussed three colors, I'm sure you can tell there's so much more to learn. So I hope tonight's story motivates you to be a little more curious about the colorful world all around you. Now you can let go and fall into a deep, restful sleep. And until we meet again, good night. Sleep well. <laughs>